today we will be back with the uh, the another interesting uh, sensory pathway or a system which is a uh, a part of the posterior column sensation i mean to say it is the pathway processing and the representation of uh, a proprioception here is a picture of uh, sir charles serington he coined the term proprioception and he introduced it even before him sir charles bell he introduced the term sixth sense for the proprioception now but uh, till 1906 uh, it was uh, not there and uh, they Sherrington introduced the term proprioception. Today we will see what it is and the physiological implications of the same. Okay, let us move on. What is proprioception? It is the sense of position and movement of our limbs. These senses also detect the muscle force the effort the velocity and the motion and also the balance as described earlier sir charles bell has given the name sixth sense because we have five senses and he said that it is the sixth sense it is also known as a kinesthesia you imagine suppose if we don't have the proprioceptors will we be able to carry out our daily routine activities especially when without thinking because some of the motions we do even uh, it will not come in the thought process it will not be registered in the cerebral cortex that is in the subconscious or unconscious mind uh, it will be happening especially the balancing your um, motion when you are in a, a particular risk pattern suppose you are going on a road and uh, a motor with a motorbike then uh, you are hit with somebody you try to balance the motorbike and you try to maintain the equilibrium similarly with anything you are falling on the standing on the edge and you are trying to this thing you sway back sway back and you just try to adjust yourself okay so now to carry out the daily routine tasks without thinking is impossible it will provide feedback to the muscles for their activity thus absence of feedback from proprioceptors would incapacitate us since we will not be able to perform any of the muscle activity so that's what the proprioception is it is uh, if i were to say it is the sense of position and movement if coming back to the uh, precise definition it is the sense of position and movement and it has four components one the joint position sense here i have written active and passive active means when the joint is moving passive is when the joint is not moving so that is when in motion when not in motion we will detect that or this uh, proprioception will detect that kinesthesia that is the it is not only the joint the entire body is moving so it is the movement movement of our bodily parts that is a kinesthesia in addition we will also sense the force that is the effort required when when we are performing a effort uh, when you are performing a work we see that it is heavy or light or uh, uh, adequate or whatever the effort required and the tension that develops the muscles the especially the muscles they become tense that is the muscle tension and the heaviness heaviness of the uh, whatever the force all these things are detected by the proprioception not only that 
the movement especially the movement it has a component of velocity it will detect the change in the velocity of the motion so all these four components are performed by proprioception now what are the types of proprioception is it conscious or unconscious yes it is both it has both components the conscious component and the unconscious component let us examine what is this conscious proprioception is about kinesthesia joint position sense and the force and the tension sense or the conscious proprioceptive aspects usually in the experimental or the clinical physiology laboratory we will uh, teach you how to mm, detect the joint sensation joint or a part movement uh, the particular position we will detect how we will detect we ask the person this is known as a position sense this is known as a position sense and uh, we ask the person to do a certain joint movement say for example i lift or i just lift the hand one hand like this and then uh, the person is asked to do the same or you lift the left hand of the person and ask him to uh, lift the other hand in the same uh, pattern or same action mode so that is how we can detect the uh, joint position ascertained typically by involving a repeated matching of a given joint position with the same opposite limb by the subject so that is the same subject suppose if we have a visual inputs you can show him and you can ask him to perform the information is processed in the sensory cortex the conscious proprioception is processed in the sensory cortex especially the uh, somatosensory area post central uh, para post post central gyrus that is the s1 s2 and the somatosensory association area and this conscious proprioception has both static that is a stationary component and the the motion component the dynamic component one other example of the conscious proprioception is a finger nose test with a closed eye you ask the individual touch the nose touch the nose uh, with a closed eye and he will be able to touch because then you he should have a configuration of where nose is and uh, where the limb is and how much the angle the limb has to be lifted up and how to reach the uh, the nose level when closed when open the eye cues cues from the eye would help the help the individual to perform this action so now when closed means uh, cues are not there and uh, it will uh, perform the action this is one of those uh, uh, concept proprioception the ability to judge the weight of the object say for example we all we all be given a test suppose if i give you some object and i will say that uh, uh, come on tell me the weight of this um, object what do you do you toss and by tossing you will be able to judge the weight because the previously with the weight of maybe 100 gram or 200 gram you have experienced certain load and accordingly you will say that oh okay it may be around 150 grams it is a uh, 100 it is more than 100 grams maybe less than 100 200 gram something like that we will be able to tell this is the ability by the proprioception then the ability to grasp the severity of muscle action while in motion so that means uh, when we are moving and if the muscle is the action of the muscle is too too much then we can detect that one important aspect this is processed in the sensory cortex this one this is about a, a conscious proprioception now about unconscious proprioception 
it is it does not require the cerebral cortex we can have a proprioception or proprioceptive activity even without the cerebral cortex involvement so that means the person below the level of the midbrain maybe he will be able to detect or he will be able to know the uh, proprioception or move the limbs are uh, trying to figure out our balance so what are called writing reflexes that means uh, just the in the midbrain animal is able to have all these uh, unconscious uh, proprioceptive activity now let us see uh, unconscious proprioception and uh, proprioception convey information about the position and the movement similar to the conscious proprioception of our body and its parts including the dynamics the dynamics includes the mass the forces the gravity and the fine internal timing and the related information the timing comes here is the velocity and the uh, sequencing the information is processed now the previous one was processed in the cerebral cortex now it will be processed in the cerebellum and these sensations or these sensory information do not reach the sensory cortex because sensory cortex is not essential they involve the spinal cord segmental level supra segmental level the medulla the pons and the midbrain and in the uh, in the uh, medulla we have the vestibular and the cerebellar or uh, the hind limb preparation the vestibular and the cerebellar centers they are essential uh, for maintaining these uh, proprioceptive activity especially in terms of the uh, posture and equilibrium so thus the unconscious proprioception is essential for number of postural reflexes including the writing reflexes the writing reflexes are those reflexes which orient the uh, the position of the head and body in space the position of the head and body in space these are called the writing reflexes again the unconscious proprioception also have a static and a dynamic components having understood about or having uh, just uh, uh, dealt with the conscious and unconscious propri proprioception we now uh, look into the receptors involved in the proprioception i have tabled here the the sum of the receptors especially these uh, are involved in the the limb motion i have not involved the uh, proprioceptive receptors for the head for the head the proprioceptive receptors are the otolith organs and semicircular canals uh, uh, present in the um, the inner ear so that means that those are the the proprioceptors for the head so they try to locate over the position and of course they try to locate the entire body positioning the semicircular canals and the otolith organs which i have not considered uh, here in this table okay having said the component these are the only the peripheral proprioceptors if i were to say the peripheral per proprioceptors and these peripheral proprioceptors are uh, the following so i meant to say that uh, the central pro proprioceptors are the receptors uh, in the uh, in in our ear semicircular canals and otolith organs they are important uh, um, for our uh, positioning of the body and even they detect the velocity the motion the gravity and equilibrium okay uh, now these are the peripheral ones now the peripheral ones are situated first the first one comes to our mind is uh, those situated in the muscle especially the muscle spindle we have examined the muscle spindle now these muscle spindles 
there are uh, primary endings and secondary endings if you if you look back here this is the muscle spindle this is the muscle spindle and uh, this must this is muscle spindle is open now this is open here we have uh, the uh, nuclear uh, bag fibers nuclear chain fibers and in this uh, nuclear bag fibers they're, they're nearly 15 to uh, 20 up such a nuclear bag and nuclear chain fibers are there. There are only two to three uh, nuclear bag fibers. These are nuclear bag fibers. Uh, they have uh, the endings here. The, these, these are primary endings. These are primary. And the one which is here, the second. The primary endings are supplied by a large velocity nerve fiber. So now I go back to the previous one. Uh, these muscle spindles are encapsulated. Uh, receptors what they detect uh, the reduction in the length and uh, the uh, rate at which it really it is reduced that is the velocity then it detects uh, what is the function of this uh, it is for the maintenance of the muscle tone that is the uh, 1a alpha gamma loop that maintains the muscle tone and then it also uh, maintains the muscle length changes whether in a, a static situation or in a motion. During motion also, it will try to uh, keep the muscle length at a constant level. Now, what are the, the nerve fibers which supply? So it is supplied by a large diameter, a group 1A afferents are also similar to the A alpha fibers. And these are slowly adapted. Then we have another type of endings. These are uh, secondary endings. Secondary endings are uh, static nuclear bag fibers. Uh, they are supplied. And these secondary endings are from a, a small diameter as compared to this thing. This is a large diameter. So that means 16 to 20 microns in diameter. And this may be about 8 to 10 microns in diameter. So these are uh, uh, small diameter fibers. They have a annular spiral or five flower spray endings. So this is spiral or flower spray endings. So then uh, they also detect the stretch, the stretch of the uh, the fibers, this muscle spindle, and uh, they try to maintain the muscle stretch. And these are carried by the small diameter fibers, group two or a beta fibers. The, con the diameter is somewhere around eight to 10 microns. And uh, then uh, the conduction velocity is about uh, uh, 50 meters uh, per second. This would be about 100 meters per second. This would be about uh, 50 meters per second. You can add plus minus uh, for that. And these are also slowly adapting. And then we have another a type of uh, the proprioceptors they are situated again in the muscle in the tendon the tendon of the muscles this is the this is the tendon here and in this tendon of the muscle these, these are the muscle fibers in this tendon of the muscles these are flower flower spray endings these spray endings they are there and these are carried by the large diameter fibers these are group 1 Group one fibers, but they're uh, they can be stimulated with a higher strength. This is group one B, group one B fibers. Okay, these are uh, Golgi tendon organs. The Golgi tendon organ. These are also encapsulated uh, flower spray endings, and they would be activated. What is the trigger point they would be activated by excessive tension on the uh, muscle that means the the uh, ligament or the fascia is stretched too much so then they will detect that uh, so that means if the muscle is contracting with a severe force of contraction or a, a very great force of contraction they will detect that and what is their function is to restore the muscle tension. They try to prevent the muscle action so that uh, uh, it will be normal. The fibers are 1B fibers and A alpha and their slow adaptation. So this is about uh, those located in the muscle. Then comes, uh, we have... Uh, we have, uh, so already I have mentioned about these two things. Uh, these are the receptors located in the muscle. 
or in the uh, tendons of the muscles if you if you look into the another group they are located around the joints and uh, these are joint capsule rough knee and organs if you, if i am looking back here this is joint this is one of the typical joint here this is a cartilage this is the bony these are two bones these are two bones and this is again a pcr ligament which is connecting these two bones and we have uh, one here pacinian carpuscle this is one and we have the free nerve endings these green ones are the free nerve endings then we have these uh, purple ones are the uh, are the the pacinian carpuscles so then we have another these are ruffini endings you just see that these are ruffini endings uh, you, you just see that these ruffini endings so these are free, the green one are the free nerve endings. So like that, uh, if I go back here, joint capsule rough knee endings, they are encapsulated uh, nerve fibers. They detect the uh, stretch, traction, and pressure. Of course, they also detect the touch. We have seen them with a tactile uh, uh, point. But here, they detect the stretch and traction or pressure. They are, uh, they identify the look joint angle or the joint twisting if you, if you are looking at the if you are looking at the positioning they will detect if there is a twisting of the joint they will be stimulated or if the joint is bent too much then they will be stretched okay so now that is the Ruffini endings then comes another type of uh, these are carried by the uh, group 2 fibers the conduction velocity is somewhere around 50 to 70 meters per second. The diameter is 10 micron. These are slowly adapting. Then we have another uh, group of uh, encapsulated uh, receptors. These are uh, Pacinian carpuscles. They also detect the joint movement. So it's just, just for example, these are Pacinian carpuscles. Okay, they also detect the joint capsule. And uh, these, uh, uh, they will detect the direction and the velocity of the joint. Because if you are doing exercises continuously, these uh, uh, the pressing and carpuscles are activated, uh, situated around the joints are activated, uh, and they will detect the uh, direction and velocity. These are again carried by the group two fibers. A beta fibers, group 2 or A beta fibers with a conduction velocity around uh, uh, 50 to 70 meters per second and uh, diameter is around uh, 10 microns. Only thing that they are uh, rapidly adapting. Another group of receptors, these are free nerve endings. Uh, these free nerve endings, uh, they detect the pressure, they detect the excessive stretch and uh, too much pressure on the joint. And these are carried by the thinly myelinated fibers, A delta fibers. The conduction velocity may be about uh, 10 to 30 meters per second, or the diameter is around uh, 5. See, I have already given a rule of a thumb. Group 1 is uh, 100 meters per second. Group 2 is uh, 50 meters per second. Then uh, group 3 is uh, 25, half of the group. 25. And the group four is an unmyelinated fiber that would be only one to two uh, or one to three meters per second. Okay, so now this, uh, the group three fibers, A delta fibers, uh, these are slowly adapting receptors. And uh, if you are looking at here, these are the free nerve endings. These uh, green ones, uh, green ones are the free nerve endings uh, situated in the uh, ligaments, in the joint capsule, and uh, uh, they detect uh, excessive stretch. These are the proprioceptors around the joint. Now, let us see how the primary endings and uh, secondary endings of the intrafusal fibers uh, uh, work at. When resting, these are discharging slowly. So that's what at rest, the muscle spindles generate a trickle of nerve impulses. So you can just see that. Uh, they, these are a uh, little, little bit in both the primary endings. This is the primary ending. This is the primary ending. This is secondary ending. No stretch. So as you stretch, this is where you are stretching and keeping it sustained. When you stretch, you see the burst of activity there. And then the activity is still remaining. 
they are not adopting here in case of the secondary endings they increase but not coming as bunches or a bust so that is what i have written here a stretching of the muscle raises the number of impulses from the spindles primary and secondary endings yes it has increased impulses in primary ending signal both the rate of change in the length so this is the rate of change in the length this is the rate of change in the length you can just see that uh, along with the rate of change in the length there is a burst of activity so whereas uh, such a rate of change in the length is not detected by the secondary endings so they are uh, the uh, they that means uh, the primary endings detect the uh, the primary endings are therefore both movement and position sensors the secondary endings respond only to a length change not the position okay now come back with the uh, the golgi tendon organs so like muscle spindles tendon organs are stretch sensors these are also stretch but they are they require a high high degree of stretch high degree of stretch so you just see that a double this side this side this is resting there is no activity when it is stretched you just see that there is a burst of activity then it slows down this burst of activity it increases with the increasing tension you, this is the tension recorded tension recorded here and with the increasing tension there is an increased burst of activity so that is what uh, uh, in the resting state the tendon organs are silent you just see that when the muscle fiber contracts it pulls the tendon strand and uh, stretches this uh, stretches the nerve endings uh, here this these nerve endings this stretches and generate uh, impulses and these are carried by 1b fibers during contraction as a muscle tension rises then falls this rises and falls the pattern of impulses increases and then decreases in a frequency and a number you just see that as it is rising more number as it is falling less number that is about a golgi tendon organs having studied about the receptors and their uh, activity now look at what are those fibers it is carrying as i have mentioned in the uh, in the uh, in the fibers i have mentioned there will be a alpha a beta and a uh, delta fibers these are the uh, fast conducting fibers 100 meters per second then uh, 50 meters per second maybe these are uh, a delta maybe 10 to 30 meters per second so these are a uh, proprioceptive uh, fibers uh, uh, carried from these receptors uh, whether they are present in the muscle or whether they are present in the joints and once they once they are uh, this thing they will come here to the dorsal root ganglion and this is the dorsal root ganglion there and once they reach the dorsal root ganglion uh, they come they come here so the it divides into two branches two branches one of the branch the medial branch this is the medial branch this medial branch ascends as uh, the fiber in the uh, the posterior column that is the uh, the bundle of gracilis or bundle of cuneatus the fasciculus gracilis and the fasciculus cuneatus this is uh, uh, it contains both okay it will ascend because this is the one which is required to carry the the conscious uh, component of the proprioception then comes i as i mentioned earlier in my earlier lecture it has a lateral division in this lateral division this lateral division first of all it communicates uh, it communicates with the uh, alpha motor that is the uh, for the muscle contraction because uh, group 1a when it is activated the what is called a deep tendon reflex uh, it will make the tendon to uh, muscle to contract so that is responsible for the muscle tone okay so now this will be making the uh, the reflex that is the spinal reflex okay so then it has another collateral here in this collateral uh, in the la uh, layer 7 layer 7 of the or lamina uh, 7 of the spinal cord you just see that uh, lamina 7 
and this part you see that after relaying the 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 syn after synapses here they will be relayed into uh, two forms one uh, on the same side on the same side they will ascend in the dorsal spino cerebellar tract for the ventral spino cerebellar tract you will get it from the opposite side this is the ventral spino cerebellar tract this is a ventral uh, part of the spinal cord this is the lateral part so now what i have mentioned i have mentioned the medial division continues as the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus and the lateral division uh, mix uh, synapse or uh, relays in the layer 7 from the neurons in the layer 7 they will be uh, beginning to originate the spino cerebellar tract and also layer 5 layer 4 and 5 they will beginning to origin the spino cervical tract so these are the uh, tracts which are responsible for the maintenance of the uh, unconscious uh, uh, proprioception now we will uh, see here the proprioceptive pathway from the muscle spindle so this is a muscle spindle so now let us examine how it works now the this is the muscle spindle the position or the uh, contraction the force is detected by the stretch and after seeing it will through the dorsal root ganglion it enters the uh, posterior horn and uh, posterior then it will come here it will come here then release release to the uh, motor neurons the alpha motor neurons and through an interneuron to the antagonistic group of muscles okay that's what we have seen as a, a stretch reflex okay that is the medial division the lateral division uh, we were we were trying to consider lateral division release here in the spinal lamina lamina seven so now this part i have made it here this lamina seven and in this synapse this lamina seven so what it does uh, it it uh, uh, it makes a synapse and this would be carried uh, from as a, a dorsal dorsal spinal cerebellar tract dorsal spinocerebellar tract or also known as a, a posterior spinocerebellar tract and this ascends up reaches the medulla and uh, reaches the cerebellum okay the, and this one this component the the one which is uh, uh, what i am talking about which comes here to the lamina seven this is a uh, unconscious proprioception whereas if you are looking at this uh, the one which is ascending in the in the um, posterior column this is the posterior column and this posterior column that the the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus column they ascend up they reach the medulla and relay in the nucleus uh, gracilis and uh, uh, nucleus uh, cuneatus and then across the opposite side and reach the cerebral cortex they are responsible con for the conscious proprioception what i have made whatever i have mentioned here i have uh, made them in a tabular form the first of all what i'm a proprioceptive pathway uh, originating from the muscle spindle so the muscle spindle when it is stretched group 1a afferent is activated when group 1a afferent is activated it will uh, re it has a medial division so what i mentioned this is a medial division and uh, this uh, uh, continues as a nuclear uh, continues as a, a posterior column that is the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus relays in the uh, nucleus gracilis and the nucleus cuneatus in the medulla and then cross to the opposite side and ascend as a medial lemniscal bundle and to reach the uh, thalamus the especially the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus and from this ventral past through posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus it will reach to cerebral cortex the cerebral cortex sensory area uh, 312 post central uh, uh, sulcus or post central gyrus and uh, 312 and from here it is further related to area number 
S2, that is somatosensory uh, area 2, and somatosensory association area, that is 5 and 7. So that is where S2 and association area, uh, they will be relayed. And then what is the function of this? It is for the conscious uh, proprioception. So I have mentioned, this is what I, I mentioned about the pathway. I have put them in words. Now, coming back, so now, how about unconscious proprioception? We just say that the muscle spindle activation, that is by stretch or movement, group 1A is activated. When the group 1A is activated, it will, so say for example, it will have a lateral division. I mentioned the lateral division. This lateral division, uh, it will relay in the lamina 7, lamina 7, sometimes lamina 5, uh, in the um, uh, spinal cord or spinal gray matter. And from here, the posterior spinocerebellar tract originates. From here, the posterior spinocerebellar tract, because it relays here, this collateral uh, relays here, and uh, as it has shown here, and uh, it will ascend as a uh, dorsal spinocerebellar tract or a posterior spinocerebellar tract, and it will reach the uh, same side, same side, and it will reach the um, cerebellum of the same side. So it will reach the cerebellum. In the cerebellum, there are uh, specific uh, nuclei. They are called a, a deep cerebellar nuclei. These nuclei meant for a spinal cord is a vestigial nucleus that is for a, the gravity and position and equilibrium and uh, axial muscles and the interpositus distal muscles that is the one which motions. These are the nuclei of the cerebellum and the where it is relayed. Along with that, it will also interact with a number of uh, uh, cerebellar cells in the uh, cerebellar cortex and it performs unconscious proprioception. This is in brief about the proprioceptive pathway uh, originating from the muscle spindle. Now, if I am looking at the, the proprioceptive pathway uh, originating from the Golgi tendon organ, this part, especially the one uh, which is about a conscious proprioception, is the same as that uh, uh, mentioned for muscle. Here, what happens, the Golgi tendon receptors, they will activate the group 1B fibers. What these group 1B fibers, they inhibit the muscle activity. So that means uh, uh, that is the immediate uh, reflex activity. They will ascend as in the, in the posterior column, uh, in the medial section, in the posterior column, in the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus. They will ascend up and uh, continue or, uh, after relaying Contralate, it will continue as a medial meniscus on the opposite side. That means there is a crossing over and they relate into the ventroposterior lateral nucleus of thalamus, then goes to the cerebral cortex, sensory area 3, 1, 2, then somatosensory area 2 for attributes and exact location and identification because the velocity, the force. Suppose if you are asked to uh, know that uh, what is the position of the, suppose you have lifted this much. This much, uh, that means the same thing has to be coming up. That means uh, both the S2 and the somatosensory area, both are working because at what level it is there, because I have closed my eyes when performing this uh, particular uh, test. So that means they will detect that uh, and they will, uh, this will be part of the conscious proprioception. There's nothing uh, different from the earlier. But here in this, uh, in this uh, part, the lateral lamina 4, they will reach the spino uh, cerebellar, ventral spino cerebellar tract. There, this was ascending in the muscle, it was ascending as a, a dorsal spino cerebellar tract. Here, it ascends as a ventral spino cerebellar tract and it crosses to the opposite side. It goes to the opposite side in the uh, spinal cord. It ascends in the opposite uh, half of the spinal cord and reach the cerebellar peduncle. Then after that, it crosses to the cerebellum. It will come back to the cerebellum again. And uh, uh, these uh, uh, supply the same nuclei, deep nuclei, the vestigial or interpositus nucleus. And this will be for the uh, unconscious proprioception. Here, if we are looking at this diagram, this is the uh, spray nerve endings, Golgi tendon organs. 
when they are activated, they will reach here one part, they will ascend as the uh, fasciculus cuneatus and fasciculus gracilis, reach the uh, nuclei of the gracilis and cuneatus, and uh, they will reach the cerebral cortex. They are for the conscious proprioceps. Then we have another component here, the lateral division. The lateral division release here in this uh, lamina uh, seven and uh, some part of the uh, some part of the uh, Clark's column. And then these synapses, they, they will ascend up uh, um, as a ventral spinocerebellar tract. They will cross to the opposite side, ascend up the ventral spinocerebellar tract, and they carry the uh, unconscious proprioception cerebellum, same side. Okay, because again, in the medulla, it comes back. It crosses here in the spinal cord, and again, it comes back. Okay, so now with this, uh, I have just mentioned about how the Golgi tendon organs are dealt, how the muscles, muscle parts are dealt, and now move on uh, to the uh, uh, thing. Just uh, uh, quickly, I go through this part. Receptors are the pathway for conscious proprioception, just to summarize up till now, the muscle and joint receptors carried by A, alpha, beta, and the delta fibers through the dorsal root ganglia, reach the posterior column, ascend as fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus. And uh, uh, before that, give lateral collaterals and relay in the nucleus uh, uh, gracilis and uh, cuneatus in the medulla. And uh, the, they cross the opposite side, ascend as a medial luminescal fiber and reach the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of thalamus. From the thalamus, these are relayed into the sensory cortex S1, the somatosensory area one, that is the area 312 of broadband. And then there is a definite topographical representation here. The outputs of S1 are relayed into this S2, that is 40 and 43, area 40 and 43, or uh, somatosensory association area uh, 5 and 7 in the uh, posterior parietal cortex for further analysis, from which I am able to place my uh, whatever the conscious uh, perception. Metatopic uh, organization and uh, homo unculus is similar to that seen with the other posterior column sensations. Okay, so now uh, the same thing here. So here it is started from the extremities. The, the, you, you have seen this graph, uh, you have seen this pathway. Uh, these are uh, the things coming from the, the fascinian corpuscle or the receptors. They will ascend up as a, a fasciculus gracilis or fasciculus cuneatus and they go to the medulla, relay into the nucleus uh, gracilis and nucleus cuneatus cross over to the opposite side as a, a medial luminescal bundle and then relay in the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of thalamus uh, and then goes to the cerebrum uh, post uh, uh, central uh, gyrus so that is the parietal cord the fibers from uh, this uh, especially uh, the spinocerebellar tract the spinocerebellar tracts uh, these these fibers are fast conducting fibers they are uh, with a, a conduction velocity, uh, group 1B fibers with a conduction velocity 100 meters per second. Because uh, adjustment of the position of your body, it cannot be delayed. If it is delayed, you will fall down because you are standing on the edge, uh, edge there and you miss the balance. You will fall down if it is not quickly adjusted. So these are fast conducting fibers uh, which are reaching to the uh, cerebellum. Okay, so now what are the pathways for unconscious proprioception? Now here I have made, because there I have mentioned only two pathways. Now here I am mentioning, so look here, it is the spinal cord. You concentrate on this part of the spinal cord. So I have written here, these are the pathways which carry the, the inputs, which are uh, relayed in the, uh, layer lamina 4 and the Clark's nucleus and uh, Clark's nucleus and then after that uh, they will make a, uh, the neurons originate and they will ascend up uh, as uh, the posterior spinocerebellar tract or uh, this is posterior spinocerebellar tract. 
this this part and this anterior spinocerebellar tract this is anterior spinocerebellar tract or they will be ascending as a uh, ascending as a the rostral spinocerebellar tract especially in the upper extremities rostral spinocerebellar tract and uh, the cuneocerebellar tract Cuneo cerebellar tract uh, exactly this yellow area here represented that is uh, uh, the neck and is uh, the cuneo cerebellar tract these are what are called these are direct pathways from here the spinal cord they will directly go and uh, talk to the the vestigial nucleus or the uh, the interpositus nucleus of the cerebellum uh, but uh, here there is another path uh, which is uh, spino olivary this is spino olivary number five number five i've written the spino olivary so that means they are originating from the opposite uh, opposite uh, fibers they come here and ascend as a spino olivary fibers they reach olivary nucleus in the medulla from the olivary nucleus uh, they will go to the cerebellum now let us examine them let us examine them so here i have mentioned uh, uh, some uh, description of these pathways direct pathways and indirect pathways indirect pathways i have already mentioned it is the spino olivary spino olivary and from the olivary nucleus it goes to the cerebellum that is why a spino olivary cerebellar pathway one from the lumbar to sacral five segments that is the lower limb these are known as a ventral spino cerebellar tract and uh, these are uh, these are coming from the golgi tendon organs just i have i have just made summarized them here golgi tendon organs they are coming from the opposite side uh, that means they cross they cross the, the one which is here is not the same it will be the opposite the opposite side and that is uh, the ventral spino cerebellar tract so then the second one is the rostral spinocerebellar tract. This is a rostral spinocerebellar tract. So this will be in the cervical uh, area that is from the uh, thoracic, uh, especially the neck and upper extremity, neck and upper limb, neck and upper limb. This is a rostral spinocerebellar tract. Again, they are originating from the Golgi tendon organs and they are coming from the same side. So I have color coded them uh, because they have almost the same property because same property means they are they are originating from the Golgi tendon organs. So what Golgi uh, what the muscle spindle does and uh, the activity of the muscle spindle is opposed by the Golgi tendon activity. So that means they try to balance the uh, balance it physiologically. So now here we have another thing. This is the dorsal spinocerebellar. This dorsal spinocerebellar tract uh, originate from uh, a cervical A to 2 L3. That means uh, below, uh, that is the thorax and the lumbar segments. Uh, you can just see that. It's the lower limb and the trunk. That is the, that is the muscle activity they will detect. Uh, and uh, this is known as a dorsal spinocerebellar tract or posterior spinocerebellar tract. So they are originating from the muscle spindle and they are ipsilateral from the same side. This is a dorsal spinocerebellar tract. Then we have uh, another group of uh, fibers. These are cuneocerebellar tract. These cuneocerebellar tract, this is here. It is along with the, um, the fasciculus cuneatus, uh, the medial part of the fasciculus cuneatus, or the lateral part of the fasciculus cuneatus. They carry the upper limb and the neck. So these are called, uh, and they are again originating from the muscle spindle and ipsilateral. This is what uh, the I have uh, listed five parts in the spinal cord. If you are looking at the previous one, five new uh, parts pathways of the spinocerebellar tract or uh, direct and indirect pathways for proprioception this is the uh, dorsal spinocerebellar tract the ventral spinocerebellar tract then rostral spinocerebellar tract somewhere here then cuneo spinocerebellar tract and then indirect pathways the spino olivary tract this is what uh, I have uh, 
uh, meant map that uh, shown it here. Now coming back here, now let us see how this uh, dorsal spine or cerebral tract uh, uh, is uh, just uh, already you have a brief idea about that. Uh, it is uh, coming from the lower limb proprioceptors. Already I mentioned about it. So this is the one, uh, this is the dorsal spinocerebellar tract, dorsal spinocerebellar tract. So this uh, dorsal spinocerebellar tract originating from the lower limb and it relays here from the relay in uh, seven, lamina seven, it, uh, it ascends up, it ascends up in the same, same side. Relay at 157, especially the seven is important, the neurons originating from seven are important to us. These are large diameter fibers which are coming from seven, ascend ipsilaterally as a dorsal spinocerebellar tract. Dorsal and uh, this is the inferior peduncle, and through the inferior peduncle, they are relayed into the, uh, the spinal, uh, nucle deep cerebellar nucleus of the spinocerebellum, that is the uh, nucle nucleus vestigius and the nucleus interpositus. And uh, these, uh, that they, they, they represent these nucleus vestigius and these things representing the lower extremity and they are as a mossy fibers. I will just briefly mention as what are they when I, when I briefly mention, uh, when I tell about uh, a cerebellum. This is about the dorsal spinocerebellar tract. These are mossy fibers. They are laid into the lower extremity. They ascend in the posterior side. Then, then comes the ventral spinocerebellar tract. This is a ventral spinocerebellar tract, this compound. And this ventral spinocerebellar tract, you just see that this is ventral spinocerebellar tract, the green one. Now what happened, it crossed and it reached here, it reached here, so that means uh, if, if you are mentioning here, so the opposite side is coming here. So that means uh, this, this, you can just see that. This ventral spinocerebellar tract, that means it is uh, relayed here in layer uh, seven and even uh, layer five, and then crossed to the opposite side and then it will it will go it will ascend up ascend up here and reach the reach the superior colicle superior cerebellar peduncle so that means a cerebellum have a inferior cerebellar peduncle and a, a superior cerebellar peduncle it will be relayed into the superior cerebellar peduncle uh, and this from again from the superior cerebellar peduncle it will cross over cross over to the, uh, move to the other side and relayed into the muscles uh, supplying the, the muscles supplying the uh, same uh, area. That means it is coming from the lower extremity, the same area. Here, these are lo lower limb proprioceptors, relay lower limb and the trunk, relay in a Clark's column. This is a Clark's column here, or even la layer seven, and cross and ascend as a ventral spinocerebellar tract. You just see that. Uh, and again cross at the cerebral, superior cerebellar peduncle. So that means uh, then relay into the spinocerebellum ipsilaterally uh, as a, a mossy fiber representing the lower limb. So this is a ventral. But uh, this is originating from the Golgi tendon organs that is originating from the muscle spindle. Then the rostral spinocerebellar tract. The rostral spinocerebellar tract, um, it is also similar, similar to the ventral spinocerebellar tract, but it will detect the upper limb proprioceptors. Relay in 157 of the spinal cord. This is 125, 157 of the spinal cord somewhere, somewhere here. So this rostral, rostral is here in the in this particular component, okay? Here in this area. Then uh, why are the inferior cerebellar peduncle relay in the spinal cerebellum? As a, that means you just see that this is a, a rostral spinal cerebellar tract. This green one, it will relay here. That is in the, uh, the Clark's column, and uh, then ascend in the same ipsilateral side as a a rostral component, the rostral component is somewhere here, and then ascend up and reach the, the cerebellum through the inferior peduncle. The cuneocerebellar tract is from the neck region, 
and uh, it will uh, it will ascend as the uh, this is here in this part. The first of all, they reach here, they reach to the layer. Um, what I, what I will say, it is the upper limb proprioceptors ascend ipsilaterally with the fasciculus cuneatus and medulla. Fasciculus cuneatus. Okay, this is the fasciculus cuneatus. Here it will it will go up, and it will reach to the the relay in the lateral cuneate nucleus. Okay, we have an interesting nucleus here, lateral cuneate nucleus. Uh, that is by the side of the cuneate nucleus, uh, lateral cuneate nucleus, and this lateral nu cuneate nucleus also receives inputs from the uh, vestibular system because vestibular system uh, also tries to give that uh, uh, vestibular um, vestibular component gives a, a collateral here. So that means uh, it the vestibular system try to detect what is happening to the limbs. So that is the component. This uh, that means this is the neck region, and the vestibular system also gives here. This is the lateral cuneate nucleus. Uh, through the inferior peduncle, they reach the the uh, spinocerebellum as a mossy fiber representing the upper extremity on the same side. So only difference here with the cunea is uh, it relates in the lateral uh, uh, accessory cuneate nucleus. Okay, so this is uh, somewhere here, this uh, cuneo uh, cerebellar tract. So this is again originating from the muscle spindle. Now, uh, coming back with the indirect pathway, the uh, spino olivary tract, the spine, this is the spino olivary tract. This is spino olivary tract. So the fibers, uh, this, uh, you can just see that this is spino olivary tract. They come to the uh, spinal cord relay in uh, uh, layer uh, three and four of the spinal cord relay in three and four of the spinal cord and the second order neurons cross and ascend to the spino olivary tract this is a spino ascend and spino olivary tract this is a spino olivary tract and this is the medulla here this is the olivary nucleus they are relayed in the olivary nucleus and then it comes back to the same same side same side same side of the cerebellum so that means uh, uh, through the inferior uh, uh, peduncle, uh, it will come back to the cerebellum for the same uh, group of muscles. This is a spino-olivary tract, but it will be reaching as a climbing fiber. Okay, so that is the uh, pathway, the proprioceptive pathways uh, originating from the, the muscles and joints of the upper and lower limbs. Now, just I have tabulated here, all I have mentioned, I just read it quickly for you. This ventrospino cerebellar tract, it is from uh, segments lumbar and sacral segments, the lower limb and the trunk or the muscles or the parts, and the uh, Golgi tendon organs or the receptors, they're carried by group 1B fibers. And uh, the first order neurons are relayed in 157. The primarily seven is important. Cross to the opposite side and ascend and cross at uh, pawns. Then cross at pawns. I just said that uh, it will go to the cross to the opposite side and uh, reach the superior uh, cerebellar peduncle and then uh, come back. So this will ascend. And the fibers from the second order neurons, they are uh, fast conducting fibers. And uh, uh, this uh, the, they, they are relayed into the cerebellar uh, uh, nucleus and then uh, mossy fiber, they are as a mossy fiber. Posterior spinocerebellar tract, again, uh, almost uh, the thorax and uh, the lumbar segments, the trunk and lower limb, they are uh, uh, originating from the muscle spindle. If you are coming here, these are uh, Golgi tendon organs, then automatically the fibers are group 1A fibers. They are related in uh, uh, Clark's column, uh, Clark's column, and also in uh, lamina 7. And uh, they do not cross, or they do not cross. They ascend ipsilaterally as as a posterior spinocerebellar tract or dorsal spinocerebellar tract. And uh, through the via the inferior cerebellar peduncle, uh, they they are relayed uh, uh, as a mossy fiber uh, uh, to the deep cerebellar nucleus, uh, granule cells, and uh, other uh, cells of the cerebellar cortex. Then rostral spinocerebellar tract, it is coming from the cervical area, upper limb, Golgi organs, similar to this, and the dorsal root, so especially the layer seven becomes important. They will not cross, 
ascend ipsilaterally and uh, uh, they will uh, be reaching the cerebellum as mossy fiber. Then cuneo cerebellar tract, the cuneo cerebellar tract again, the neck region C2 and T7, neck and upper limb, muscle spindle, we just say similar to this, the muscle spindle, and it will go along with the fasciculus uh, uh, cuneatus and uh, but there is no relay here. There is no relay here. They will uh, ascend along with the fasciculus cuneatus and uh, uh, then relay in a lateral cuneate nucleus in the medulla. Lateral cuneate nucleus in the medulla. And they do not cross. Uh, and uh, the, they are second order neurons originate from lateral cuneate nucleus on the ipsilateral uh, cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle as mossy fibers. So indirect pathway is a spino olivary tract. It is coming from all segments. That means at each segment we have the olivary tract, entire body, and uh, it will be taking information from uh, proprioceptors. So actually the spino olivary tract, if you are looking at uh, the functionality component of it, uh, it will for correction. Suppose you are, uh, you are trying to do an action Okay, you want to um, lift a box, the weight of the box you do not know. Then you will go with the dimension of the box and you will with, go with a lot of uh, weightage. Suddenly you discover that that box is empty. So that, that, that means there is a overshoot. To prevent that overshoot, the spino olivary tract works. So that means it is, a, it is generated from all the things. It's indirect one. And uh, it will be going with the proprio all proprioceptors help. Dorsal root to lamina 3, 4, they are the relay. And from here, they cross to the opposite side, ascend uh, as an olivary tract to the inferior olivary nucleus in the medulla. And uh, then from the olivary nucleus, uh, it will reach to the oligocerebellar tract through the inferior cerebellar peduncle as a climbing fiber. So that is the uh, tabulation of the various, uh, uh, the proprioceptive pathways, unconscious of proprioceptive pathways. I have in this table, everything has been uh, uh, provided. Now coming back here, uh, because I talked uh, something about uh, the cerebellum. Now, we need to know a little bit where they terminate. Okay, here is a cerebellum. This is the physiological uh, diagram or a functional diagram of the cerebellum. Cerebellum here, we as physiologists, uh, we divide it into three parts. The one part, this is a lateral part. This is a lateral cerebellum or known as a cerebral cerebellum. This communicates with the cerebral cortex. Then this part, the, the, the central and the intermediate, this is the spinocerebellum. The spinocerebellum, this is vermis and paravermis area. This is the spinocerebellum. This is spinocerebellum, what I was trying to talk about, that would be the thing which communicates with the cerebellum. And this is a nodular lobe. And this one is a vestibular cerebellum, vestibular component of the cerebellum. Now, so now this is spinal cerebellum. This one has a, a nuclear, deep cerebellar nucleus known as a dentate nucleus. It connects with the motor area. This one, the yellow one, this is a flocular nodular lobe. It connects with the vestibular nucleus. That is for the balance and eye movements. These these two, that is the vermis, this is the vermis is connected with the vestigial nucleus. And uh, uh, this, uh, the lateral paravermis area is connected with the interpositus nucleus and they will be for the motor execution. Let us see in the spinocerebellum, which includes vermis and paravermis area. This is vermis and paravermis area. Vermis has, uh, deep cerebellar nucleus as a vestigial nucleus and uh, the output goes to the vestibular nucleus and the reticular system. And this modulates the axial muscles, especially the muscles which maintain the posture and the gravity. These are called axial muscles, the vermis area, this area, the vestigial. So that means it will take help of the vestibular system and the reticular system. The nucleus interpositus, interpositus is here in this uh, uh, paravermis area. 
nucleus enteropogetus uh, is uh, because it is combined with the two nucleus globosus and the uh, nucleus emboliformis. So that means uh, this nucleus enteropogetus receives uh, proprioceptive inputs from the distal muscles. So distal muscles means the muscles which perform the actions. So all these distal muscles, uh, they are uh, supplying this paravermis area. The output of this goes to the red nucleus in the midbrain, the collicular nucleus, the reticular nucleus, and uh, the, all these three things, uh, red nucleus, collicular nucleus, and reticular nucleus, they modulate uh, the distal muscles. So they try to damp the or the prevent the overshoot uh, and also try to regulate the eye movement, the ocular movement, because this collicular nucleus uh, is for the ocular movement. The direct pathways end as a mossy fibers, indirect pathways uh, end as a climbing fibers. Uh, let us see what are those uh, mossy fibers. And, uh, so this is what the cerebellum is, uh, topographical organization. This is how our uh, bodily muscles are organized in the cerebellum. Look here, it is being represented two times, two times here. You just see that this is the part. So this is one part of the right and the left. They are joined here in the middle, in the vermis. This is vermis. This is paravermis area. Okay, so this is also known as the intermediate zone. And uh, so you see that this is the one, and both the eyes are on either side. And uh, this is the tail is here, the caudal, caudal is here, and the rostral is here, and you have the eyes. And this is the topographical representation in the cerebellum. Okay, so now having been considered, now let us see what are those uh, mossy fibers in the, the climbing fibers. So we were talking about whatever the excitatory inputs from various parts, they will reach the vestigial nucleus. And these vestigial nucleus gives output to vestibular nucleus and reticular nucleus. That is what I said. So these are the, this is the deep cerebellar nucleus. That what I am trying to name it as a vestigial or interpositus. The output from this, this is the output. This output, in case of vestigial nucleus, it goes to vestibular system, vestibular nucleus, or reticular nucleus. In case of interpositus nucleus, the output goes to red nucleus, collicular nucleus, and reticular nucleus. This output. Okay. These mossy fibers are all the direct cerebellar pathways, the spinocerebellar pathways. First, come and relay or excite the deep cerebellar nucleus. This is the deep cerebellar. Also, it gives collateral to another group of cells present in the, in the cerebellum. This is the cerebellar cortex, that is a granular cell. This, they will excite the granular cells. And these granular cells, in, in turn, will excite another cell, which is a very big cell, Purkinje cell. This is a Purkinje cell. This Purkinje cell uh, checks the, the deep, deep cerebellar activity. So this is the loop it works. In the event, we have other uh, cells uh, uh, like basket cells, uh, stellate cells, which I, have, I will uh, deal separately when I, when I talk about cerebellum. But anyway, so these granular cells are excited, which in turn excite the Purkinje cell, which in turn inhibit the uh, deep cerebellar nuclear activity. So that means action has started, action has to uh, end. So this is the starting and ending to, to make the actions. Similarly, the granular cell activity is also controlled controlled by this mossy fiber. It activates the another group of cell, what is called a Golgi cell. The, this is Golgi cell. This Golgi cell inhibits, in turn, inhibits this. Uh, and uh, whatever this is activated here, this is also activating Golgi cell. And this is also activating on the cell so that the granular cell activity, granular cell activity is monitored. Okay, so now just briefly, I, I, I will come in detail when I talk about cerebellum, I explain each of these circuits in a um, detailed manner. Meanwhile, the excitatory output, the vestigial interpositus, these are the deep, deep cerebellar nuclei, the mossy fibers from the direct spinocerebellar tract to excite. I have already mentioned about that. These mossy fibers excite the deep cerebellar nuclear cells, the granular cells, and the GC cells. 
that is a Golgi cells. And uh, they will inhibit this thing. And it is, uh, this inhibition is a slow stoppage. This is a slow stoppage. Okay, so then climbing, these are climbing fibers. Uh, these are climbing fibers coming from the olivary nucleus. The climbing fibers are originating from the olivary nucleus. You know that uh, a spino olivary tract, olivospinal, olivocerebellar tract. So the spino olivary tract gives relation to the olivary nucleus. Then olivocerebellar tract excite this, okay? So that will produce certain amount of action. And at the same time, they would excite the Purkinje cell very, very greatly. So that means uh, it will, uh, the abrupt break, uh, abrupt break, uh, this is slow breaking and uh, abrupt breaking. At the beginning of the motion, there is excitation followed by inhibition, thus dampens or prevents the overshoot during action. This is what uh, the cerebellar uh, uh, processing is happening. Okay, so now what are the various uh, clinical conditions associated with the proprioception? Uh, one important uh, condition already we are aware, the subacute combined degeneration. Subacute combined degeneration is the deficiency of the vitamin B12. It may be resulting either from the deficiency, uh, dietary deficiency, or because of the uh, pernicious anemia, wherein the intrinsic factor is uh, uh, not there. The gastric uh, uh, glands do not secrete the intrinsic factor. And this intrinsic factor is necessary for the absorption of the vitamin B12. The subacute combined degeneration, this is very much essential for the myelination or the, the production of the myelin. And then this does the myelination suffers and the myelination, especially the thickly myelinated fibers are the first one to be active. So that means it produces the demyelinating uh, condition that, was, that is one part. Other demyelinating disorders like inflammatory, any infections, the toxic because of the toxic uh, chemicals and the viral or genetic causes, uh, they will uh, also produce the similar effect uh, on the, uh, the proprioception. One of the conditions are the multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is a, a degenerative uh, demyelinating disorders. And uh, this is again a Guillain-Barr syndrome. It's another de uh, degenerating, maybe originating from the viral or a toxic uh, origin, Guillain-Barr syndrome. Then a uh, third thing is a tapes dorsalis. Tapes dorsalis involves again the large diameter fibers. It is a form of a tertiary syphilis. Uh, it, it is uh, rare nowadays. Other genetic disorders uh, such as Friedreich's ataxia. All these things uh, would, uh, would involve large diameter fibers and thus produce uh, because uh, large diameter fibers are uh, here in the, in the periphery and also large diameter fibers are there uh, from the spinocerebellar tracts. So thus uh, they are more vulnerable. But preserve the pain and thermal sensations because these are not uh, the large diameter, these are small diameter fibers. How to evaluate the posterior column sensation? One is a Romberg sign. So Romberg sign, here in this, uh, we will ask the person uh, to stand with a closed eyes, with a closed feet. With the feet held together, he should stand up, erect, and close the eye. In case of a posterior column uh, lesions, because they carry both conscious and unconscious sensations, the person will sway on either side and even may fall. The inability to maintain the balance is due to the absence of uh, uh, proprioceptive inputs uh, reaching from the, the extremities, from the spinal cord. To the cerebellum. Thus, even though cerebellum is quite all right, cerebellum is wonderful. So this type of uh, loss of coordination is known as ataxia or sensory ataxia. Sensory ataxia because it is originating from the loss of the uh, posterior column sensation, especially the proprioception. This is, uh, this is called a Ramberg sign positive. So with closed eyes. So now I will be cerebellar ataxia. Cerebellar, this, suppose that if the sensory column may be normal, if cerebellum is not working, so then what happens? 
So motor ataxia result from cerebral arm lesions. This is motor ataxia. This is sensory ataxia. Where person is not able to balance even when the eyes are open. Even when the eyes are open, so he is getting cues from the visual inputs. Still then he is not able to balance. He will fall down. This is a cerebral or ataxia or a motor ataxia. So when this sensory, when he closes eyes, if he sways and if he falls down, it is Ramberg sign is said to be positive. This detects the, the proprioception function of the uh, spinal cord. Then other functions, uh, we just evaluate the deep tendon reflexes. Loss of deep tendon reflexes, uh, loss of a Golgi tendon, inverse stretch reflex. So all these things would indicate the, the loss of the function of the proprioception because uh, the group 1A, group 1B activation is important for activating the muscle spindle or the muscle activity. Then another important thing the, uh, about the gait. Gait is the, the person, how he walks. Normally when we walk, we walk comfortably. Here, what happens, he will be very cautious and he would hit the ground with force. In this situation, because he tries to see the ground and tries to hit the ground, because it is called a stamping gait, because the inputs are not reaching. That is why he wants to see the ground. The patient with the damage of the spinal posterior columns, uh, what happens, he processes the peripheral, uh, because the peripheral processing is absent, the dorsal roots and dorsal column and this thing, walk with a narrow base, so he is very, uh, very much cautious, look down to place the foot on the ground, because uh, he tries to use the visual cues to move or this thing, and when he looks down, because he does not uh, detect the force, how much force to be applied, because of the body weight, uh, we are we usual we casually the, he does not know how much force to apply. He stamps, he bangs his feet uh, down uh, clumsily. That is why it is called a stamping gait. The person loses balance and uh, often he falls down. It is due to the absence of uh, a position sense or proprioception. Uh, in these individuals, especially you may find it in a, uh, the uh, vitamin B12 deficiency or uh, uh, degenerative demyelinating disorders. So in this person, hip is hyperplexed, externally rotated, forefoot is dorsiflexed. It is further this thing, only thing I have described, it is a stamping gait. He looks, he looks at the ground, he forces and the stamps on the ground. That is what his gait is. That is a stamping gait. It is because of the uh, loss of proprioception or sensory taxi. Now, uh, these are the uh, books I have referenced. So, uh, I'm, I'm telling you it is the mixture of a uh, number of uh, books and uh, even articles. The Principles of Neuroscience by Candle, the Guidance Textbook of Medical Physiology, the Genong's Review, then uh, Keel and Neil, that is Samson Wright's Applied Physiology. In addition, I have mentioned some references uh, along with my uh, figures. Okay, the assignments, uh, I just read the assignments here. Name the receptors involved in proprioception. Describe the pathways carrying conscious and unconscious proprioception. Describe the receptors pathway carrying unconscious proprioception. So that means so you just uh, look at that. I had given enough information here. Add a note on the Romberg sign. And uh, write short notes on gait in a person with posterior column lesions. That means you, you need to say that a stamping gait. Sensory ataxia. Differentiate between the ventral spinocerebellar tract, doxal spinocerebellar tract. Difference between a conscious and unconscious proprioception. Subacute combined degeneration. Tapes dorsalis. Draw a label diagram showing a pathway of dorsal spinocerebellar tract, showing the pathway of a ventral spin. Uh, again, this this one I, I forgot that a ventral spinocerebellar tract. Draw a label diagram of a transverse section of the spinal cord showing unconscious pathways of proprioception. 
And then this is another question, name the pathways for unconscious proprioception. The stamping gate, Romberg sign, receptor spark proprioception. You can have a, a number of uh, these things. Uh, if you just make a, a few points each, uh, that would cover the entire topic. Okay, uh, the next lecture, I will continue with the interlateral column sensation, the pathway and processing. Especially, I will be dealing with the, the pain sensation. Okay, uh, thank you.